happening? Welcome back. Chris Anderman here with Peter Van Buren. Hi, how are you? Welcome to Hawaii. We're going to be doing a bit of a, a Hawaii live stream, as you guys know, uh, as we explore here in the, the heart of Honolulu, capital of Hawaii. Absolutely. Right? Just a beautiful day here. It's easy to forget about us in the COVID season with travel being as difficult as it is, but we are still here and Hawaii is as beautiful as it was the last time you visited. And if you haven't visited, boy, do we have something to show you today. So we've got a few minutes before we're going to get started, started like we do. Uh, we just let the audience kind of gather up. So say hi, uh, let us know that you're there. Um, and, uh, and as always, feel free to share this live stream if you're watching live. If you're watching as a video later on, you can also share it. Uh, and if you're over on YouTube, go ahead and just hit that thumbs up button right now. You might as well, you're going to do it by the end of the video, so you might subscribe. as well do it now. Just do it and, and exactly, and subscribe. And even better than just subscribing, turn on your bell notifications. That way, every time we go live, you'll be able to find out. And you can choose then if you want to join us or if you don't, uh, you'll never miss a live video in the future. Because we've got a lot of great stuff planned. The other thing you can do for us while we're getting set up is let us know if you've been to Hawaii before. Go ahead and leave a comment and that way we'll know for the folks who have been here what to highlight. And for the first timers especially, we'll know to hit some of the really important stuff for you. Let us know also if you're planning to come out and visit us, uh, maybe take the tour live with me. Maybe you'll find some questions that we can answer for you. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. Uh, if you guys are out there on YouTube and Facebook, I'm not seeing any comments yet. Just want to make sure that we are actually live streaming. Um, and uh, see Vic over there, maybe gives us a thumbs up in a second. Um, I put the latency on very low. So should we, yeah, okay, good. We're there, perfect, fantastic. I'm on extra latency. I just switched to decaf this morning. <laughs> nice, nice. Oh God, I've been so spoiled with, I finally, I finally went and got myself a bag of Kona coffee, and uh, it's changed my, my perspective. Well, stay tuned because we're going to talk about how coffee made it to the islands. It did, it's not indigenous here. It was brought to Hawaii, and that's one of the things we're going to talk about a little later today. I mean, is it kind of everything brought to Hawaii? Like, Well, in it... a way, I was brought here at one point in time, but the islands have been here for 30 million years. So you could, I guess, argue that everything was brought here, but at some point we're going to have to uh, sort out the new stuff from the old stuff. Fair enough. Ah, oh, here we go. There Com we go. Comments are starting up. Thank you, guys. Jenny Jean, thanks for the purple heart. Uh, Anna Maria, thank you. Welcome back. It was good to see you this morning. Nikki and Ross, love you guys. Yeah, Chris and Peter, here we are. Hey. And Margaret Gibson, hi from upstate New York. Yeah. All right. Welcome. I was born in New York many, many, many years ago, but I was born in the other part of New York down in Staten Island. Um, oh, yeah. I was always jealous of upstate because you know how the Staten Island jokes go. I mean, it's like we're the Jersey of the five boroughs, but we try very hard. That's one of the reasons I, I came here to Hawaii is just self-shame, really, about growing <laughs> up in, uh, in Staten Island. Well, now I know, how you, I, I know you must feel that way because if you've seen any of our New York videos, we, we're not always very kind to <laughs> Staten Island. No, 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 <laughs> we're used to it, we're used to it. Uh, Michaela says, I've never been to Hawaii, and I think I never will. Unsmiley face, no, no, Michaela. No, 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 please, please, please. Everybody's going to have a, a long to-do list, and Hawaii actually right now is very, very affordable. I don't want to sound like a TV commercial, but, you know, the airlines have really cut the fares. Mm -hmm. COVID has taken a bite out of, out of tourism, but the airlines have cut the fares. It's off-season between now and the end of the year. Mm -hmm. If you skip Christmas, there's some bargains, and certainly if you're willing to come out here during that cold, snowy winter, back east in January and February. That's the cheapest possible time to visit. Okay. And if we're lucky, we'll also give you some tips here on how to save money once you're here, including where to find a free tour. Ah, excellent point. And if you haven't noticed it already, in um, the both on Facebook and in YouTube, you should be able to see the, um, the link. Well, on YouTube, for sure, you can see the link to Hawaii Free Tours. Um, and uh, be able to click over to that website. I'll add that link as well to Facebook. I don't put the link up on Facebook ahead of time uh, because then Facebook penalizes us for having outside links inside of the tour description and then they won't show the video to as many people. Uh, but I'll put that up uh, after the tour. Uh, and then on both locations, uh, you can already see Peter's PayPal donation link. Now, you know, you'd never say it yourself, but look, the fact of the matter is, is that it's a free tour and guys working on the free tours work on a pay what you want donation basis thank you um, so uh i mean not to steal your thunder but the link's there you guys know how it works you don't i never ask for me i ask for the guides that's okay? very kind thank so, you very much so that's where that goes and it goes straight to him so there you go 
Um, Jenny with another purple heart, much appreciated. And um, yeah, yeah. Alrighty. Let's see what time it is. So before we get started, I wanted to point out that Chris is not actually taller than me. This is a, uh, a CGI thing that we're doing here. Um, it has to do with the time-space continuum and the trade winds here in, in Hawaii. We're actually roughly the same height as, uh, as Tom Cruise. But the same barber. We, go and to we, we, do, we do go to the same, same barber. They get it two for one. You know, They used to charge by the, uh, the ounce. Uh -huh. uh, but now they just really uh, hit us both at the at the same time, and they do they do my dog too. Yeah. The same the same guy. <laughs> nice. It's really uh, it's really quite so convenient really for us. Yeah, if you have a barber that charges by like the square inch, the square and inch, just like yeah. how big is your head? That's, yeah, 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 yeah. That's the cost. The calculation you know? part would be tricky. Right. Me how are they they measure? What is that called? Those people that used to a phrenology. Phrenology. Yes, they used skull to actually sizes. look at people's skull sizes, and that's a funny thing. But it, in a way, it, it, it's another little tidbit about Hawaiian history. Hawaii was very affected by the immigration laws that uh, changed over the years uh, in the United States, and not so much the uh, the ones in the 1920s, which were based on phrenology. But, in fact, everything connects to Hawaii. You think it's far, far away, but it's just not uh, as much about that. Now, yeah. somebody's going to is going to have to go to a party tonight, but you're staying home to learn more about Hawaii. Well, thank you very much. We're going to try to be at least as partially interesting as the party. Um, I can't promise much music, um, but we will try to entertain you. And, and I'm only slightly creepier than the guy who is probably going to spend all his time with you at the party. So I think we're OK here. And Maria's in Paris, so there are no creeps. There, there. are no creeps. All right, fine. <laughs> well, sorry. Um, it's not Paris, but it's Hawaii. Exactly. It's true. No palm trees in Paris, I don't there think. There are none. No, not, a, not good ones like we have here. Right. Although I guess in the Tullery, uh, do they have? I think they're, they're prob there's probably there's got to be like an indoor greenhouse uh, palm tree somewhere in well, Paris. Well, need we say it? The French actually were very involved in early Hawaiian history. Um, as everyone knows, they were one of the European powers that was in the Pacific Ocean. And they ended up uh, taking home Tahiti as a colony, mm. as kind of a consolation prize. Mm. But I'm afraid Hawaii went, uh, went with the Americans uh, and, and the British and things like that. But the French have an influence here and played a role in, in Hawaiian history uh, as well. Uh, Michaela, you're too kind. I am not a great singer, but I have no fear. I appreciate that. And Michelle, mom, hi from New York. My mother is up in Kingston, New York. Right okay, now, beautiful Rosendale, place, York, just right a beautiful right place. Yeah. Uh, and Maria writes, they have palm trees in the south. Well, oh, they're not right. in uh, Kota Zoa, right? Well, we'd like to think that maybe ours are, we're going we're gonna to have to take a little bit of Hawaiian pride here and say that maybe ours are, are a little bit better. I, it could be true, actually. But one of the things, is very interesting, I actually saw someone open a coconut with his bare hands recently. Oh, my goodness. It is one of the things that uh, is part of native culture. Uh, Hawaii, once upon a time, didn't have knives and tools and things like that, and they learned how to open the coconuts with their bare hands. You can actually do the same thing with a pineapple. Um, don't drop off of our live stream, but if you go to YouTube and Google pineapple and coconut uh, with your bare hands, you'll see these extraordinary people. It's kind of like a magic trick to see it done, but it actually does work, and I've seen people do it. It's not fake. Wow, um, they're not like smashing it ahead of time. They're not like... smashing it ahead of time. They're not hitting it against the side of their head or anything like that. Uh, it was a, a technique that you had to know if you wanted to live here back in, in, back in the day in the day. Mm -hmm. um, and so our coconut trees, uh, our palm trees, uh, and many of them are coconut trees, of course, and they actually do generate fruit. And it's one of the great things here in Hawaii. There's nothing, nothing better than sitting on the beach with some cold coconut milk, um, occasionally an adult beverage included uh, in that process. Nice. Um, you can't really That's get much better than that. I love, I love France and I love upstate New York, but some things we keep for ourselves. That's it. That's it. No, I mean, you know, uh, one of the great byproducts of uh, sugarcane and sugar production is and rum goes really well with pineapples and coconuts and all that kind of stuff. This is a really neat thing that's happening right here in the islands now. And if you come out and visit us, you'll, you'll see what I mean is the I don't know if we call it the revival or the rebirth or, or just the beginnings of a wonderful local rum industry. Mm. Um, beer as well, because of course beer is, is mostly water and our water in Hawaii is just exquisite. Mm. It's all filtered through natural volcanic rock and it tastes great. But with our uh, indigenous sugar cane and the good water that we have and some smart people 
learning how to make it, um, I have really, really started to appreciate the rum here. Someone had kind of commented that Hawaii, you know, you've got Guinness in, in, uh, in, uh, in Ireland, you've got bourbon in Kentucky. You know, Hawaii kind of lacked its own uh, native drink, if you will. And rum, I think, is really a contender for that. So uh, stick around, and if you do come out and visit us, um, find a place that has some local rums in it. They're easy to find and, and sample a few and see what you think about it. Have you been up to the Kohana uh, distillery, that rum distillery there? I have there? not yet had a chance. Have you been up there? I haven't yet, but it's something I'm planning to go and visit. I've heard all out. sorts of good things. I mean, essentially, if you've got the right water, you, you're, you're about 90% of the way home on, on things like that. And. Uh, Real quick, just want to say, uh, Nikki and Ross, who are watching from their honeymoon right now oh, in Malta. Oh, congratulations! Congrats again, to you guys, and so glad you guys are having a great trip. I followed part of it on Facebook. Uh, Malta looks amazing, and uh, it'll be poorer once you leave. So hopefully, you'll end up being able to stay even longer. Happy than honeymoon! Uh, and uh, Parvati, good to see you again. Always welcome to have you back, Lorraine. Uh, thanks for joining, and Michaela sends us a beer mug. Um, Excellent. So when I when I do the distillery uh, visit, Michaela, I'll have to let you know because uh, maybe we can even do that as a live stream. We'll see that would be fun. That would be really fun. I'm fascinated by things like this because it's the, it's the most basic, simple thing in the world is is this process of distilling things into alcohol and yet you can make little tweaks to it and come up with all sorts of amazing things yeah when i lived in new york i actually conducted pizza tours oh. and one of the things that we enjoyed talking about it's there course, was exactly how the simplest things you're talking about to make the dough you're talking about flour water and, and salt and mm -hmm. yeast. These are the most big, people have been doing it for 5,000 years. Mm -hmm. uh, when I had a chance to visit I Iraq, we found these ancient pizza, uh, well, they didn't, weren't making pizza, these ancient bread ovens mm -hmm. that had been created 5,000 years ago by the Sumerians. And you could take one of those, if you brought it to New York, you could make excellent pizza in it. These techniques awesome. haven't changed, but people have gotten smarter about how to refine it, and especially with distillery, how to purify it to the point where it's just just delicious. Mm, mm. I'm ready for a drink. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's a little early for us, though. Well, no, no, it's, it's, a, it's fine. It's almost, it's evening in Malta. Exactly, for those guys, they're 12 hours ahead in That's Europe right, right so now, I think it's, so. it's always time for uh, a drink somewhere. Um, well, should we, uh, what do you think? Should we, should we give them the history? Do you feel like doing it? I'm sorry, I just was having a drink there. <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would love to do that. Yeah. We ready to get started? Yeah. Let's do this. Sure. Tour begins now. Okay, great. Alabama uh, Ma Man returns. Hi out on Twitch. Thanks for joining us. Always great to have Twitch viewers as well. Uh, and uh, we're going to get going, guys. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step over this way. Well, first things first, I'm going to flip the camera around. Uh, dun, dun, dun. Camera flipped. And... Well, welcome and thanks again to all our friends we've been chatting with, uh, honeymooners and upstate New Yorkers and everybody. Thank you for joining me here in Hawaii today. My name is Peter Van Buren and I work for a group called Hawaii Free Tours. And among other things, we do some local food tours and things, but what we really focus on is providing some of our history and culture here in the islands. There has been a lot of discussion over the COVID year and a half about the role of tourism here. And one thing that everyone agrees on is that Hawaii is much more than Waikiki. Waikiki is one of my favorite places on the planet to spend time. But once you start to understand the complexity of Hawaii, Waikiki itself becomes even more interesting. So thank you to all of you for taking a little time out of your day to learn about Hawaii's history and culture. You've taken a huge step towards responsible tourism and you're supporting a local company at the very, very same time. Now, Hawaiian history runs back 30 million years. In order to get through it in about an hour, I'm going to have to skip the first 29,900,000 of those years. If anyone needs a refresher course, here it is. 30 million years ago, where I'm standing was open ocean. From a God's eye view, there was nothing to see here but the blue, blue waters until one day a plume of lava erupted out of the sea and began forming the very first of these Hawaiian islands. The lava cooled and over geological time formed an island. Now, unlike what many people think, there are not separate lava jets under each of the islands. In fact, all of the 
islands were formed by the very same lava jet, the one that's erupting right now as I speak on the big island of Hawaii. The process continues. And as the lava cools, the tectonic plates, these massive parts of the earth that slide around underneath us and cause earthquakes, sorry to those in, in, in California and Asia, but they slid westward and sort of pushed the completed islands to the side and the new island came up and took its place. So our most westward islands are the oldest ones, our eastward islands are the newest ones, and better or worse, we're the only part of the United States that's getting bigger. So hurry out to Hawaii before there's another island on it that you want to want to go to as well. Now, because of the way Hawaii was formed, literally out of the earth, our story today has a theme. And that theme is a particular word in the Hawaiian language called aina. And it literally translates into the soil. And you can see the rich volcanic soil in my hand here. But the word itself has a much more complex nuance. And in fact, it's the key to understanding everything about Hawaii. Aina to us means a relationship between people and the soil, between people and nature, that we as human beings are simply one part of a larger, larger process here. And our job is to fit into that process, to become part of a cycle of the soil, the earth, the sky, the trees. And it's not hard in Hawaii to kind of imagine that. If you just look around me here today, we're surrounded by beautiful trees, by nature itself. I know that our technology doesn't allow you to, to smell what I'm smelling, but here in Hawaii, nature is omnipresent in all of your senses. It rained a little bit this morning, and the soil has a richness to it that is unmistakable. It's a perfume that pervades our life and reminds us at any given moment that we are just part of a much larger global system here. And when you come to Hawaii, this is what you experience. Now, for that 29,900,000 some years of Hawaiian history, nothing much happened here, at least as far as people were concerned. There were no people. The islands are far, far away from everything. In fact, arguably one of the most geologically isolated places on Earth. And for most of that time, nobody was here. Trees grew, plants grew, birds dropped seeds. And then one day, about 2,000 years ago, the first people arrived. They're the Polynesians. They left the Indus Valley centuries earlier and populated most of South and East Asia, starting in Taiwan, moving across the Pacific, what we call Malaysia, Singapore, all that area, New Zealand. And then finally, following the trade winds, came here to this soil, this Aina of Hawaii. Now, these people were badass navigators, if I have to coin a phrase. On the other side of the world, while the Polynesians were navigating thousands of miles of open ocean, looking only at the sun and the moon to orient themselves, the state of technology in the Western world was ancient Rome, where they were afraid to go too far away from the coast for fear that they were gonna fall off the edge of the earth. Spoiler alert for those of you that watch the History Channel, there's no edge of the earth. It just keeps going. Now, the Polynesians arrived here and they colonized these islands in a way that was consistent with this sense of Aina. They lived in small family, extended family groupings, 10 or 12 families. To call them hunters and gatherers would be an insult to hunting and gathering. No offense to anyone out there who's hunter and gatherer. But there was so much food here. It was so lush that you just literally had to reach out and pick up fish in the ocean or grab something that was growing. There was no need to have any sense of private ownership because there was no need to own anything. Take what you need, use what you take, share it with your neighbors if, if necessary. And this concept of lack of private ownership becomes one of the most significant drivers of what ultimately becomes a somewhat tragic history here in Hawaii. Now, if you've been paying attention to the news, you've seen all these stories about space aliens, flying objects. Now, maybe we all agree that we don't all believe in all that, but keep in mind what happens with first contact. In 1778, after years, centuries of isolation, Captain James Cook, a British explorer, first arrived here in these islands. He was looking for the Northwest Passage. He tried twice from England to go over the top of the uh, globe 
couldn't find his way through. The third time around, he came around the Horn of South America, up the coast, the trade winds blew him into Hawaii, and he didn't find a Northwest Passage, but he became the first outsider to see the Hawaiian Islands. Now, Cook was visited here, was greeted here by the Hawaiian people as a god. They'd never seen a Caucasian. They'd never seen someone who didn't speak in their language. They'd never seen ships the size of his. And very significantly, they'd never seen metal. These islands are so new, geologically speaking. The soil hasn't yet developed the iron ores and things that allowed Western Europeans to begin making metals. The Hawaiians had no concept that this was, this was an almost miraculous substance. And it caught their attention and caught them in a way that we'll find had dire consequences. Now, things went along fairly well between Cook and, and, and the indigenous people for three years. Cook would wander off, try to find India, couldn't find it, came back. Things went well until one day, the Hawaiian, a group of Hawaiians decided that they wanted to try one of these boats out for themselves. It's a natural thing. The water is everywhere here. And with no concept of private ownership whatsoever, they hopped onto one of Captain Cook's boats and took it for a bit of a, what we would consider a joyride. Well, while the Hawaiians didn't really have a concept of a private ownership, the British actually did and sent a raiding party ashore led by one William Bly. Now, somebody out there knows who William Bly is. If you know what uh, famous ship he became the captain of that suffered a mutiny, go ahead and put it in the comments. We'll see who gets out there first on uh, William Bly's things. Well, William Bly was not a nice guy from early days, and even as a junior officer, he led a raiding party ashore, and he slaughtered 40 Hawaiians in retaliation. The Hawaiians, having no concept of private ownership, did, however, understand revenge. <laughs> and so they kidnapped James Cook, and they boiled him alive. Now, someone might ask, why did they boil him alive? Well, the real answer is because of his marrow. The bone marrow the inside of your body is where the native Hawaiians believed your mana lies. The actual strength, your power, not only as, as an individual with muscles, but also your power as, as, a, as a man, as, as, a, as a near god. And by boiling him alive, they gained access to his marrow and were able to eat it, not the skin, the marrow, and with that, capture his mana. Now, there's one other way that you can actually get mana, and this one is kind of in the PG plus category. You can actually make a baby, and the father's mana and the mother's mana will combine and create a super mana baby, if you will. The problem is, is that many of the Hawaiians, particularly in the leadership class, had no concept of genetics. And so their belief was that a man with high mana would mate with a woman of high mana albeit his sister or mother, because they had equal levels of mana, and in fact create a, what they believed to be a super child. We know today that these such incestuous couplings are going to produce a lot of birth defects, and that is going to come back into our story in a very, very big way. Stay on like that. Has anybody figured out who William Bly uh, was the captain of? He was the captain of the Bounty. And the famous uh, book, book and movie, Mutiny of the Bounty, characterized his uh, evil reign as captain. Check it out. There's about three different movie versions of it. I myself am partial to the one with Marlon Brando, um, and not only because uh, it was filmed here in the islands, but also because it's Marlon Brando, people. Nonetheless, back to our story here in Hawaii. The British left, and of course, who shows up on the scene? Because who always shows up on the scene in history? The Americans. Now, the Americans have a much more commercial drive behind them. They're looking to trade with the Hawaiians, and they find an audience. Hawaii at that time is covered with sandalwood trees. Some of you may have used sandalwood as a perfume or a fragrance. It's a beautiful smell, but at this time in history, it was known as a medicine, and particularly it was exportable to China. The Hawaiians were happy to trade sandalwood in return for metal products and particularly guns. The guy who really sort of understood it all, and in bits, times of history there are these individuals who are in the place, the right place at the right time to understand they're at an intersection, is the man who's pictured on the statue over here to my right, Kamehameha I. His father had been the king of the big island of Hawaii. He had taken over, and he began actively trading with the Americans for guns. 
He had an ambition to conquer the Hawaiian island chain and to make himself king of a sovereign nation, the new sovereign nation of Hawaii. With the help of the Americans gained from him, as well as tactics, he set off on what was to be a 20-year quest to conquer all of the major Hawaiian islands. He was not a diplomat, he was not a negotiator, he was a warrior. And his conquests were oftentimes bloody, often involved the slaughter of many, many warriors. The famous final battle, which resulted in him ruling the sovereign state of Hawaii, took place not far from where I'm standing, a place called New Pali where he, along with the weapons that he employed, backed up 400 enemy against the cliff and pushed them over, falling to their deaths. He ruled Hawaii and created the monarchy here for the very, very first time and created the sovereign state of Hawaii. Now, we, we, before we move on to greet the, the great man in person, we do want to dispense with his son, who briefly appears on the historic stage. Kamehameha II is known as the last live royal birth that ever ascended the throne. Remember that problem of incest we talked about just a moment earlier. He also began a life of decades long, multi-lifelong fascination between the Hawaiian monarchy and the British monarchy. Queen Victoria was on the throne way out east or west. We're Hawaii, we can go either direction to get to England. Um, and there was a fascination with the monarchy. He became the first uh, Hawaiian monarch to actually leave the islands, try to travel, made it all the way to Britain, didn't really meet the queen, got the measles and died. But the good news is, as I promised you, his funeral ship bringing his body back to Hawaii brought the first coffee plants with it. We talked in our introduction here about Kona coffee and those coffee plants arrived here in Hawaii on that funeral ship. So it may not have been the best journey for him, but overall it's really paid off. And certainly if you're here in Hawaii, have a cup of our delicious Kona coffee. It's what keeps me awake 23 hours a day to make these videos for you. Let's take a walk and visit the great man himself and take a look at his statue and see what we have to say about that. As you can see, we are not alone here today. The Kamehameha statue is one of the more popular tourist attractions outside of Waikiki. And while we certainly don't want to be disrespectful, I do want to call your attention to the woman who is uh, bringing flowers uh, to the king. And if the, uh, if the viewers are working in high enough depth, depth they can not only see uh, her paying her respects, but also see that others who have been here earlier today have left flowers and some very small uh, uh, tokens uh, of appreciation to the king. Now, there's a lot going on here that may not be as obvious as first glance. Um, if we kind of shuffle this way a little bit, let's take a close look at the king's face. Now, most of you have seen uh, people here who identify as Hawaiians, indigenous people, people of, of Hawaiian ethnicity. And I'll ask you, do you think that image of his face, that representation, looks like what you've seen of Hawaiian people? Most people will say no at this point in time. No. This statue was actually uh, sculpted around 1900 at a time when Hawaii had been largely taken over by Western influences, particularly the United States. And Hawaii was, was really struggling to find a way to identify with its own culture at the same time having seen that culture collapse under the weight of Western capitalism. And so instead of depicting the king as he actually looked, he was a very heavy gentleman with very powerful features, a large nose, they actually hired a sculptor to make him look like Julius Caesar. And the image there is particularly important when these days in the United States when we talk about representation, when we talk about how people see themselves, how they identify themselves. And so looking at his face, we get a very good sense of how Hawaiians were seeing themselves at this point in time and particularly seeing their own culture. That idea extends to the building behind the statue, which is the current Supreme Court building. Uh, gentle people of a certain age will also recognize it uh, from the original Hawaii 5 series where it was a stand-in for police uh, business at some different times uh, in, in the past. Um, and this building was built in 1872 in mimicry of European architecture. Even the stone itself, the, the uh, 
granite block blocks that build the building were actually imported here to Hawaii and it was built to look as foreign as possible and to incorporate as few native elements of Hawaiian culture as possible. And that really speaks to how people were seeing themselves and their own culture at that point in history. We'll see how that changes a little bit later in the tour. For now though, we need to cross the street and find our way over to the only royal palace that's ever been built on American soil. Come on with me. Excuse us. How are you all today? Good, good. And where are you guys visiting from? Connecticut. Connecticut. Right. That is a long way from here. There we go. Yep. Now, some sharp people have noticed there are many differences between Connecticut in, and Hawaii. <laughs> One of them is how we cross streets. Now, I don't know if we want to do this or not, sure. but I have found in my work as a tour guide that how one crosses a street is a remarkable cultural thing. People, for example, in New York treat street crossing as a competitive uh, body sport. Others treat if you walk outside of a crosswalk, we had a gentleman here from Sweden who was actually shaking, worried that he was going to be arrested crossing the street outside of a crosswalk. So I've come to respect that there are many ways to cross a street, and when we do have groups here, we try to find them. Now, let's give, I want to give you a peek at the Ayalani Palace, the only royal palace ever built on American soil. And just as soon as you take a peek at it, I'm going to ask you to forget about it for a moment because in our historical timeline, it's not here yet. <laughs> Instead, let me direct your attention to the lawn next to the, uh, the palace and particularly these trees behind me because these trees have been estimated to be close to 250 years old, which meant that they were standing here witness to Captain Cook's arrival and the earliest, earliest parts of Hawaiian history. And in fact, this place, these palace grounds and where we were just standing with the statue have been important to Hawaii as a place going back into its prehistory. The earliest Polynesian travelers here felt power in, in the land. They believed in both physical manifestations of God, for example, Pele, the fire god, took human form once in a while, but more importantly, they understood that everything, every tree, every bush, every handful of soil, the aina of Hawaii, actually had a spirit in it. And this place was always known as a very powerful place, and that's one of the reasons why these trees have stood here for 250 years or more, witness to all of Hawaiian history, because this is a very special place. It's a powerful place. It's a place where if you do get a chance to come here yourself, and you spend some time alone here, whether you believe in those types of spirits and energies or not, your opinion of that stuff will be forced to change. Come here at night sometime. I'll be happy to take you here and let you experience it for yourself. And that's why you travel, because you can only get so much off of a live stream, so much off of a book. But when you're here and you stand on this ground, you feel what it feels. We need now to continue our story by moving to the other side of the world. Hawaii and Hawaiians like to talk about how isolated we are. But in fact, events here in Hawaii are controlled by outside events as soon as, as much as night follows day. The year is around 1830. The Hawaiian monarchy has acquired its third uh, throne sitter, Kamehameha III. But what happens next is driven by events in the Atlantic Ocean on the other side of the world. At this point in history, the slave trade, sadly, is at its peak. Goods, manufactured goods from Europe are flowing down to Africa where the ships are reloaded with African slaves taken against their will across the Middle Passage and set to work primarily 80% of the slaves taken out of Africa set to work in the Caribbean at the sugarcane plantations. The remaining slaves on ships are set to work in the antebellum south growing, working cotton and tobacco. The ships then carry the sugar up to New York City where it's offloaded and American products are put on. This is known as the triangular trade and it's feeding an enormous amount of sugar and other goods to the east coast of the United States. However, at the same time, the United States has been expanding westward. And in California, without a Panama Canal, without a transcontinental railroad, 
getting these things, the sugar in particular, to California is near impossible. It's very expensive. And a group of folks in California who, depending on your politics and your, uh, where you stand on things, are either business people, entrepreneurs, capitalists, imperialists, or I'm afraid to say rapists, um, take a look and say, if we can grow sugarcane in the Pacific, we can sell it to the California market and we can make a lot of money. And the place to do that is right here in Hawaii. These people arrive, they're known as the five families. You know one of the famous families, the Dole family, the pineapple people. They arrive here and they begin creating plantations. Now the Hawaiian king, Kamehameha III, and the people here are, I don't mean to be insulting, are almost like the roadrunner in the old cartoons. You remember where the, the, the coyote would look up and the giant thing is falling and everybody knows what's going to happen except the coyote? You can use a snowball analogy if, for, if you're in the uh, East Coast. They don't understand what's happening. The full weight of Western capitalism is about to hit Hawaii. It begins with a guy who just happened to be first in line, William Hooper, who creates the first plantation to grow sugar cane here in Hawaii. Soon after that, the other families begin to lay out these massive plantations, bigger than anything in antebellum South. And the king really, with no concept of private ownership, with this sense that what do you do with land, you take care of it, is hit with this extractive agriculture. And by extractive, I mean the goal of these planters is to take everything out of the soil, to plant sugarcane over and over and over again, to strip the soil of its riches and change that into money, which they take with them. And Hawaiian land is suddenly put under this enormous strain and the king doesn't know what to do about it. That's his first problem, but he's got some more. The second problem has to do with his indigenous population. They are being literally ground and destroyed as he watches. And there's two factors at work. The first is that unfortunate ticking time bomb of incest. The number of live births is declining dramatically. There's no real number that you can put on it. I've seen estimates as high as 97% of children not making it through their first week. That number is probably a little high, but even, for example, in tenement New York City, you were looking at a 30 to 40% infant mortality rate, so it wouldn't surprise me here that it was actually even in those higher numbers. The second problem, however, is disease. When Captain Cook's men first came ashore in Hawaii, despite their good intentions to mingle amiably with the local people, they brought ashore with them not only good intentions, but also syphilis and tuberculosis and typhoid and the measles and all sorts of Western diseases that the Hawaiians had no immunities to whatsoever. It's not a new story. It's the same thing that happened with Cortez in Mexico. It's the same thing that happened in the Spanish conquests of South America, but it did its job. It devastated the Hawaiian population. At first contact, there were an estimated 600,000 indigenous people. A hundred years later, the population had dropped to only 20,000. That's a genocide. There's no other term for it. And so the king is watching his own people disappear. Now that begs the question of who's doing all the work on the sugarcane plantations. Because the plantation sugarcane is very labor intensive. That's what's driving much of the slave trade in the Atlantic Ocean. And there's no one here alive, quite literally, to do the work. Well, what's a capitalist to do? you go looking for workers. And the capitalists, the planters, found them in China. China was this time was under extreme economic pressure. For those of you that have uh, done the reading, we sent the reading out. Uh, you, did you all get that? Um, this is the time of British conquest uh, and colonialism in China, the Ill opium wars and things like that. People are so desperate to leave China that this is the deal they take. They agree to work the sugarcane plantations in Hawaii for five years in return for free passage across the Pacific. Now that is a tough, tough deal. You have to be very desperate to trade five years of hard labor for a boat ride, but that was the situation. Then to sum up, the king has lost his land. By the middle of his term, 75% of the arable land in Hawaii is in control of the plantation owners. By the end of his term, 95%. 
He has lost his homogeneous society. Chinese laborers are being imported into Hawaii. And number three, his indigenous population is quite literally dying in, in front of him. He's desperate. He tries two different things, neither of which work. The first is the great Mahele, which is a land distribution program. It falls apart under the weight of corruption, under a tax scheme that doesn't actually allow for redistribution, and it's simply the plantation owners simply are not giving up any land to be redistributed. One of the biggest beneficiaries of the land distribution is the king's wife, who happens to also be his sister. So this doesn't work. He then tries one more trick. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. The British are still in the neighborhood, in fact, in the name of Captain Jonathan Paulette, a very ambitious young British uh, naval commander who agrees to invade Hawaii. The king welcomes the invasion. You've all seen the Hawaiian flag. It's got a little British Union Jack up in the corner, and this is partially in remembrance of these events. He invades Hawaii. The king says, oh my gosh, I've been invaded by the British, and eight months later kicks the British out. Hawaii actually was a titular British colony for eight months. The king kicks them out in a very dramatic way, and on a ceremony that he stands on the steps of the church over here that we'll take a look at a little later, he proclaims the monarchy restored, the foreigners have been ejected, and Hawaii is once again a sovereign nation. It's a heck of a speech. They build a whole park to celebrate it, Thomas Square. They have statues. Every June in Hawaii, we celebrate Restoration Day. And yet, it didn't really happen that way. Some of you may be surprised that not everything you're taught in history class in, in school is actually true. What really happened is, A, the British Admiralty in London had heard about Paulette's little adventure and said, we are done picking fights with the United States. We've lost two wars to them in the last couple of years. Stop fighting over there. And more importantly, the United States, which had great financial interest in Hawaii, sends the USS Constellation here with 150 armed Marines who encourage the British to leave. It's known as the Paulette Affair. And it really is the final chance for the royal family here to push back against the plantation owners. And it fails. Let's take a little walk. And while we're walking, talk about the next two kings, Kamehameha IV and the V. Come on this way. Now, walking backwards is always a treat for me um, and could result in some fairly dramatic video footage here. If you'd like to see me fall backwards, go ahead and give a thumbs up uh, on there. Um, if you prefer that I remain standing, uh, what should we do? Thumbs, thumbs down. I don't no, know. No, no thumbs down. Thumbs, no, I don't do thumbs down. Um, our, our code is plus one. Okay. If you so, want to see something happen, give a plus one. Can we say hello? Can we say hi to this gentleman right here who was kind enough to stop his weed eating? Thanks, Uncle. Appreciate you. Thank you very much, my friend. Gave us a shaka. I'm pretty sure these guys follow me around. If I were to, you know, take the, uh, the flu system and do, start doing a tour in Malta, I think there'd be some guy cutting the grass there. <laughs> you know, it could be four o'clock in the morning. Um, nonetheless, we, got to, we promised to tell you about the next king, Kamehameha IV. Now, we're talking here around um, 1850 or so, and he tries a new strategy. And his strategy is to negotiate with the people in Washington to get tariffs removed on Hawaii sugar. He figures if you can't beat them, you're going to have to join them. And it works. The tariffs are removed. The economy here boobs 722% in one year, which is more than your cryptocurrency is doing for you at this point in time, or my 401k, actually my 401k has been devalued to like a 399k. So, you know, well, we keep trying though. Nonetheless, he negotiates this treaty, the economy booms in here, Hawaii, he goes back and he renegotiates this treaty, but this time Washington has been watching the Sopranos, which didn't exist then, but you're working with me people. This is happening on so many levels right now, I can't really explain it. Um, if you like The Sopranos, give a thumbs up. If you haven't seen Many Saints of Newark, it is awesome. If you don't like The Sopranos, don't bother watching because it won't make any sense. It's like tuning in halfway through Winnie the Pooh and saying, why is the donkey sad? You can't, you can't just join it in the middle. Nonetheless, Kamehameha, second time through, he renegotiates the treaty, but Washington says, no, 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 no. We want more than money this time. We want Pearl Harbor. Washington has been watching the rise of Imperial Japan and realizes there's going to be some muscle tussle out here in the Pacific Ocean, and Pearl Harbor is where that is going to work out of. And King 
gives Pearl Harbor to the United States. For the first time in Hawaiian history, some of the aina, the soil itself, has literally been given to a foreign power. There's a place in Hawaii the king can't go without permission. It's a turning point. Meanwhile, the planters here, the plantation owners, they don't want tariffs removed. They want the whole thing. They want a ring on it. They want the United States to annex Hawaii, formally take it over, do away with all the taxes and fees. They want to trade with America as an equal. They want to become a territory. They want access to government subsidies. And they start begging Washington to please, please annex us, take us over. Now, President Grover Cleveland, and thumbs up to anyone who recognized Grover Cleveland as one of our presidents. I only know because when I was a kid, they used to have milk cartons and the president's pictures were all on the side. And we used to fight because like the, 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 some kids would get like George Washington and I'd always get Grover Cleveland. Oh, wait, here's a challenge. My last name is Van Buren. Martin Van Buren was a president of the United States. I will personally kiss anyone who can tell me what president he was. First, second, third, whatever. Okay, back to our story. I don't know how we're going to arrange the kiss. We're going to have to work that out through some kind of PayPal thing. Virtual, not, virtual. Vir virtual kiss. That's probably... <laughs> there's a bad joke. We're not going to do it. Okay. Grover Cleveland says, no, we're not going to overthrow the Hawaiian monarchy. We're not going to annex the territory. Instead, however, he's willing to work with the planners. He reinstates the tariffs. He doubles them. He puts this onerous economic crush on Hawaii and devastates the economy. The Hawaiian monarchy loses its credibility. No one is paying attention to them. No one will listen to them. Essentially, the plantation owners have taken over the running of government functions here in name, but not yet in actuality. King Kamehameha V, the quicker we get him off the stage, the better, and there he's done. Fast forward, the plantation owners decide it's time for them to choose a king and they elect among themselves a guy named David Kalakua to be a king and David Kalakua is the first monarch that actually gets to live in the only palace ever erected on American soil and it is a gorgeous gorgeous building the architecture was actually modeled after an existing structure in Venice of all places and Kalakua took great pride in it now once again Remember the, the atmosphere. Remember what's going on around him. Why is this a Western building plunked in the middle of, of Hawaii? And the answer, of course, is that Hawaii has seen the domination of Western culture. Call it cultural imperialism, if you like larger words. But essentially, they have seen their own culture collapse in the face of it. And they're going to honor their new overlords, if you will. And they build a Western-style building. They import the granite. Kalakua himself is the first Hawaiian to circumnavigate the globe. And uh, we see we've got a comment there. Unfortunately, Martin Van Buren was the eighth president. Nikki Henderson, I, I just don't know what to say to you, but you, you, earned, you earned your virtual kiss uh, from us here. She's on her honeymoon with Ross, so Ross And she's deliver. on her honeymoon. Ross, I hereby uh, empower you as a uh, uh, deputized tour guide to offer the uh, ceremonial kiss. Um, Chris and I will not, but we do wish you aloha and congratulations on knowing your history better than about 99% of, of other Americans. Dale wrote, I, I just remember that Van Buren had the sideburn. That's exactly, <laughs> exactly. I did not inherit his hair, nor his stature, nor his job. He was actually, just as an aside, probably our most corrupt president. Oh, wow. It's a tough, it's a title that many have, have really vied for. I mean, recently. You uh, know, it's, it's, until <laughs> until recently. Oh, don't do politics oh, on no tours, politics Chris. On no tours, politics, politics on tours. Sorry, sorry. All right, back to the palace. Um, the palace is just a gorgeous, gorgeous building. And they, uh, there are tours available. Um, virtual tours are very difficult because the... Uh, trust that runs the palace uh, takes its work very, very seriously and is very careful to guard its image. However, if you are interested in the interior, if you come here to Hawaii, you can certainly take a tour of it. Um, but if you're not going to be able to get out here uh, right away, there are some YouTube videos that were professionally made mm -hmm. that give you a look at the beautiful interior. Among other things, there's an attempt to uh, imitate Western Victorian England interior design using native woods. The palace itself, uh, David Kalakua, was the very first uh, monarch to live in it. He was the first Hawaiian person to circumnavigate the globe. He actually met Thomas Edison 
in New York City and persuaded Thomas Edison to come back to, with him to Hawaii. And this building had electricity, thanks to Thomas Edison, um, as well as a telephone and indoor toilets before the White House and even before Buckingham Palace. If he had only bumped into Tesla, who knows what we would have had here. But uh, that's one of those little bumpy points in history. Thomas Edison also shot some of the first film of Hawaii. And if you are a good YouTube spelunker, you can actually see some of that. It was shot in 1909. Uh, this building uh, was uh, built about 30 years earlier than that. But some of the earliest film of Hawaii was shot by Thomas Edison. Nonetheless, the second Kalakua finished his term here. He was uh, seceded by the people's king, David Lunalio, who was also elected to the throne by the, share, the, uh, the plantation owners. And he didn't really do a whole lot. As the people's king, he didn't even take his uh, puppet role very seriously. He spent most of his days in a public park, uh, enjoying a little bit of adult beverages, reading books, and chatting with his subjects who would drop by. That park is uh, hard to see from right over here, but it's actually just a hop, skip, and a jump. He didn't really want to walk very far, and I, I can appreciate that. It's hot here sometimes. The last monarch is very important, and that's, that's the queen, Lilio Kalani, and we're going to take a longish walk and meet her right around the back of the building. Now, as we're walking, we get another nice look at the grounds. Over here, you can see the bandstand. Pre-COVID times, there were actually all sorts of wonderful concerts. You can come out here and uh, picnic. Our hope would be that at some point when you're ready to visit us here in Hawaii, those concerts will be back and we'll be able to show The next building of interest here, and if any of you are uh, military veterans, you know that the military hotel in Waikiki, kind of the secret hotel that's only available to military uh, people for R&R, &R, is named the Halekoa. Um, you can't stay there unless you're in the military, but you can visit this Halekoa. This is the barracks of the Royal Palace Guard. They were kind of a little bit more than a police force, a little bit less than a, uh, an army, if you will. But uh, that's where they stayed. That corner of the plot here was also historically the execution ground. And with Halloween coming up, we may need to think about some ghost stories. This area alive with spirits and alive with psychic power here. In fact, the trees right in front of us are, are banyan trees and they remain one of the most beautiful things here in Hawaii. They grow vertically and they send their roots down. This tree here is unestimable how old it is. In pictures of the palace, as the palace was being constructed, this tree was already grown and an adult. And in Hawaiian lore, these trees are also known as soul catchers. There's a particular type of soul that doesn't rest and will try to escape, and these trees will catch them, their souls, and keep them where they're supposed to be. And given this area and how alive it is, it was used as a burial ground long before there was ever a place we called Hawaii. Long before that, there's a lot going on here. If we have any anime fans out there and they, you know the story of Totoro, I just look at this tree and think of that story. If you haven't seen that movie either, it has absolutely nothing to do with Hawaii, but it's a really good movie. So check that out. We're almost ready to exit the royal grounds. And as we do, we're coming up on the final monarch, the last monarch in the Hawaiian monarchy and we'll tell her story in just a moment. Let's find our way outside the grounds here. People will ask a lot of times uh, about visiting these places, and one of the things that makes Hawaii such an attractive destination is how open everything is. There's no fences, there's no ticket booths, there's no nasty guards or metal detectors. Everything is here for you to see. It's a spirit of openness that, that really, really touches on that spirit of aloha, the way that we like to live here. And if you can come out here and, and join us in participating in that lifestyle, then all of this opens up to you. And understanding this history is a big step that you're taking in order to kind of connect with it. Can you ask a quick of course. You used the word aloha a couple of times. Yes. What does that mean? Well, the Hawaiian language is a very rich language and includes uh, 
words of, of description, but also words of, of a greeting. And the word aloha means both hello and goodbye and is used as a greeting, but it also describes a way of thinking, a way of looking at the world. And we talk about doing things with aloha or, or bringing aloha spirit into it. It means kindness. It means offering without expectation of, of receiving. It's a generosity and it refers to the way that we should interact with each other, as well as referring to how we as people should interact with the environment around us. This idea that everything has a place and a purpose, and our job is to figure out how we fit in to that very complicated relationship. Wow, what a great definition for a word. It's a beautiful word and a beautiful way to live. You wake up every morning and, and think, well, how do, how do I structure my day? What do I build this around? Um, and if you think about Aloha and you look out the window and see the sky, see the ocean, you realize how easy it is to accept that as a way of, of, of living. Lovely. The last Hawaiian monarch is Jenny, Lily. Jenny Jean gives a shout out oh. to Totoro. Totoro is so <laughs> wonderful. Please, sorry. Someone, uh, the last Hawaiian monarch is this woman here, Lily Okalani, and she is very well revered and respected in Hawaiian culture. You can see that people come here as they do with the king statue and leave flowers and different uh, tokens here to show how much uh, the place she does retain in people's minds here. She has uh, been elevated over time into almost a, a quasi-religious figure, though albeit a tragic one. She took the throne in 1891 at a time when the plantation owners were getting increasingly greedy and increasingly ready to take over running the country formally. And the monarchy had moved from kind of an interesting sidelight to a puppetry to just basically an impedance to what they really wanted to do, which was to extract the last little bits of life out of these islands and squeeze them dry. And so they made a move to get rid of her and the monarchy. In 1893, a group of plantation owners accompanied by armed U.S. Marines went up those stairs into that door and arrested the queen in her own throne room as she sat there. It was a coup. It was an annexation. It was a formal disposition at gunpoint. They then imprisoned her in her palace, locking her away on the second floor of the palace at the far end of her own bedroom and for five years, the only time she was able to step out into the sunlight of Hawaii was to walk that walkway on the second floor back and forth, imprisoned in her own house as plantation owners took over her country. She was only on the throne for two years. A tragic heroine, of course. She made good use of the time. She wrote three books while she was locked away. She wrote the song Alohae, that many people are familiar with the Elvis Presley version of it. Uh, we don't sing on this particular tour. Uh, we don't sing on the VIP tour either. It's, uh, you know, the, the Cheap Seats tour is where I do most of my singing. But nonetheless, the other interesting thing here is if we can take a look at her face. Now, you remember we looked at King Kamehameha I. His face was sculpted in 1900 um, and was direct imitation of Julius Caesar. He didn't look anything like he did. Now this statue was erected in 1980 and you can see the beginnings of a change here. The queen herself, and there's plenty of photos of her online if you want to take a look, was again a very large woman, very angular face, a bulbous nose. She had nearly beautiful but this is the beginnings of trying to create more likeness of her something that's much more representative of her as she looked than to kind of fake portray her as somebody Western. Um, she remains a tragic heroine in Hawaiian history and is very much revered. Now, I want to show people something that very, very few visitors actually get to see, and if they do see it, they may not actually understand it. On the side of the statue here, we can see that and I'll just kind of walk and point at it, we can see that a plaque has been added showing her reign as queen from 1891 to 1917. Now, she did in fact ascend the throne in 1891, but as we just mentioned, two years later in 1893, she was 
forced, deposed by force, and forced into literal prison in her own home. That's what would be underneath this plaque if we were to peel it off. It would say 1891 to 1893. However, a group of young Hawaiians who have come to understand Hawaii's history and culture better and believe that they still are a sovereign nation petitioned the government a few years ago to add this plaque extending her titular reign to 1917, the year of her death. And so according to this plaque, she remained Hawaii's monarch until her death in 1917. The original dates, 1891 to 1893, all they stood was to confirm the illegal annexation of Hawaii, in their point of view, by the United States, the imperialism by Bayonet Point. And so something right here is very, very telling as to how people see themselves, how they see their history and culture and how they believe themselves to be. We call this the Hawaiian sovereignty movement and this goes back to the idea that Hawaii still is a sovereign nation. You see this uh, among many Native Americans in the United States who still believe that uh, their country, that their, their areas are independent countries that were stolen from them by the United States. But here in Hawaii, amidst all this paradise, we oftentimes don't realize that there's a lot of anger that's still residual left over from events hundreds and hundreds of years ago. All those people who say, why do we study history? Well, we study history to understand the present. Behind me, and we'll have a little bit better view of it in just a moment, is the Hawaiian State House. This is where modern Hawaii is governed from. It was built in a somewhat brutalist architectural style in 1960 because that's how the 60s were. Nonetheless, it for the first time begins to incorporate some native Hawaiian elements into it. It was built out of concrete, unfortunately. But again, the 60s were a weird time for, for many of us. From a better angle, we'll see that there are eight pillars on each side of the building that represent the eight major islands here. You can see, you'll be able to see how the pillars rise up from the ground and splay out into imitations of palm trees when they reach the top. And that's another Hawaiian element. The building itself is under uh, reconstruction right now, and so we can't go inside, but if you were to go inside, you'll see that the interior is hollow. There's a portion of it that has no roof. And this is part of our Hawaiian architecture, our way saying that there's very little difference between inside and outside. There are reflecting pools that remind us of the Pacific Ocean that are currently uh, boarded up there. There's a lot of work being done and they're legislating by Zoom these days, not meeting in person. But this is where the governor's office is and where they make all the laws and rules and stuff like that. And some very pretty grounds here. We're heading over to uh, cross the street and uh, this is a street called Punch Bowl. If you were to take Punch Bowl all the way up into the mountains, you would arrive at the National Cemetery of the Pacific War, where many of the soldiers and sailors and airmen who lost their lives during World War II are buried. It's a beautiful, beautiful, somber place. Um, it reminds, if you've been to Arlington National Cemetery, it's very similar to that, but really mostly World War II, Korea, and then some Vietnamese, uh, some people who died in, in Vietnam. It also grants you one of the most beautiful views of Honolulu and Waikiki, a panoramic view that you see really from coast to coast. It's a place that many people don't stop at. Um, it's a little bit off the beaten path, but if you've got some time and transportation, there. For any of you that, uh, we'll go this way, any of you that uh, uh, have a, want to become a tour guide in the future, getting hit by a car is usually not recommended. Oftentimes what will happen is the driver will only leave you one star on Yelp um, and then you're in the hospital after that. Back to our tour. Across the way here, we're walking past the Hawaii State Library. This is the only state library that, that serves the entire state of the 50. You can order a book from the furthest reaches of Molokai and they'll pull off the shelves here and get it out to you there. This was a gift in 1920 by the industrialist Andrew Carnegie, the steel guy, back in the day when billionaires were kind enough to donate libraries and not build spaceships. Nonetheless, we're happy to have it. One of the things, just to get a little off the topic of the media tour, is one of the most often asked questions we get is, is where do we eat? Where should we eat? And the simplest answer is 
the further you get from Waikiki, the better the food gets and the cheaper it gets. And so try to schedule some, some time out of Waikiki. Uh, you can take a bus, you can take Uber, you can rent a car, and the, the, your options will expand dramatically. If you like Chinese food, we have a very large Chinatown um, that's accessible by car or bus. Um, some of the best Chinese food is actually in a, in a shopping center called Ala Moana, which is actually walkable from Waikiki. There's a place called Jade Dynasty, which kind of on the outside looks a little tacky, but in fact is awesome, awesome food. It dim sum particularly. Now, if you need uh, more recommendations on food, our website has a whole page um, that will give you our favorite places, and we do do food tours that people are welcome to sign up for uh, as well. If you're in Waikiki, one of the best tips is to get out of the hotel. I don't want to speak ill of any hotels. I love them all. But in terms of food, take a walk. Even if you go just a block or two off of the main drag, you'll start to find more local restaurants, smaller places. Kind of look for the size of it. You can almost kind of say the smaller the place, the better it's going to, it's going to be. Certainly, the less expensive it's going to be. Um, I, actually, uh, I actually joined you guys on your food tour. Uh, and it was excellent, uh, highly recommendable. Go to fish market, go to a great pastry place uh, and taste a bunch of different, what's the, what's the purple? Poi. Poi. Poi is one of the few plants that the, uh, the it's from the taro plant, the root of the taro. Uh, and you grow it and then you pound it into uh, mush so that it actually is, uh, it, you can eat it from a solid form to a, to a sort of kind of like a pudding form. And that was actually one of the few plants that was cultivated by the Polynesians. Mostly, as I said, they were hunters and gatherers, but one of the few plants that they actually grew were those taro roots. Mm -hmm. um, if you're here for a little bit longer and you have the time, there are uh, tourist organizations that will actually have you go out and help harvest or grow taro as a way of sharing that cultural element. That's you can cool. Google them up and find them and they'll have you out there in the mud and you get all nice and dirty and at the end you get to eat some delicious poi as part of understanding what's going on. So cool. in it things. It's a really, really rich place where you can eat your way into history and things like that. Hawaiian food, there are two great places that we take guests. One is called Helena's. Both of these you need transportation for. One is called Helena's and that's Hawaiian food the way Hawaiians have been eating it for quite some time. The um, problem with Helena's is that it's just getting too popular. Anthony Bourdain did a piece from there. Uh, Barack Obama, when he would visit the island, would sometimes go there. Um, a place that I would suggest that's as good or not better, but certainly less crowded, is called the Highway Inn. And it's in a neighborhood called Kaka'ako, which is an up-and-coming neighborhood, has a lot of growing artisanal places, coffee shops, good stuff like that. It's, uh, it's a longish walk. You pass through it on your, this one. It's a longish walk from Waikiki but it's not an impossible walk and it's an easy bus ride. Ann Maria asks, which way is the beach from here? That way. My, my, my gut feeling was every direction. Every direction. It's an <laughs> island, people! There's beaches everywhere! Um, the, beach, the beach is closest that direction, let's be fair here. And in fact, you're gonna find more of Honolulu Harbor than a beach per se right out here. But there are a lot of, one of the great things to do, if it's particularly if you rent a car, is to go to a different beach every day. And you can do that for a very long time here in Hawaii. Ask around, look, look online, pick which beaches. There's beaches that are great for sitting and sunning, beaches that are better if you're into surfing or boogie boarding, beaches that are better for snorkeling. Just get people's opinion. And in fact, it's one of the things you can do is when you talk to local people, if you're kind of looking for something to talk about or something, ask them where do they would suggest you go to eat, what beaches do they like. It's a very popular topic of discussion here, and people are, you find are often very, very happy to tell you almost all the great places. Everybody wants to hold one beach for themselves um, and keep that one kind of a, a secret. My, uh, my, my, my giveaway for people is to visit a, a very nearby beach called Magic Island. It's uh, walkable from Waikiki. It's across the street from the Ala Moana Shopping Center, but it's only local people. It's a very quiet beach. It's great for if you have children. Uh, it's a unofficially dog friendly and just a, a great place to, to go. Um, but you can't, it, you can't do wrong. It's really quite beautiful. We're here at our very final stop of the tour to talk briefly about the role of the missionaries. 
Now, the missionary story begins very early in Hawaii's story, and we've kind of left them out. They've been, their activities have been running kind of like a baseline underneath every event that we've talked about so far. And I've saved them for the end because I, I like to use them as an, as an example of how complicated history really is. The first Western missionaries showed up here around 1820, and these were tough people. They had left their uh, uh, congregations in uh, the uh, New England. They were primarily Calvinists and Protestants. They had left there. They had evangelized and fought their way across the American West and reached California. When they got to California, they had a um, joint company with some Mormons, and they had heard about the problem out here with whaling. Now, Hawaii in its early days was a whaling station. Long before the sugar cane really started to be uh, grown here, Hawaii was a place to catch whales. Then, as now, it was on the migration route for the great whales moving between the warmer waters here and the cooler waters uh, at the Arctic. And the whalers were coming from all over the world. Many of our influences, including food, were influenced by the Portuguese, the Spanish, the Russians, all of these different groups who came here to kill whales. Whale oil was currency in those days. It was worth its weight in gold, and Hawaii was where that happened. Now, the whalers, of course, needed to come ashore and refit themselves, and unfortunately, they brought with them the sailors' culture. And in a number of towns, particularly on Maui, they created little dens of, of iniquity, prostitution and opium and drinking and gambling, all the bad stuff. And the missionaries had heard about this and crossed the Pacific to come to Hawaii to bring God's army to bear against the whalers. What they found here shocked them, however. In their diaries, they referred to the islands as one of the most unchristian places they had ever encountered. They saw that people did not live in monogamous relationships. They saw problems with incest. They saw that men oftentimes paired with men, women with women, a type of person that was very avowed in Hawaiian, early Hawaiian society, uh, known as a mahu, was someone who the gods had not chosen to be a man or a woman, and played a very important role in a lot of ceremonial functions. But the, to these missionaries, with their very stern Calvinist beliefs, now, this is not on my watch, people, and the missionaries set about evangelizing here and quote unquote reforming Hawaii into a Christian image. Now everything here has a quotation marks around it because I don't certainly intend to insult or degrade anyone's re religious beliefs, including the native Hawaiians. Nonetheless, the missionaries set about it with great zeal in what we could only consider a cultural genocide. They banned the Hawaiian language. They banned the hula as too sensual. They tried to do away with much of Hawaiian's crafts and ancient uh, cultural practices, the tattoos, the carvings, anything that the people here used as a touch point to their own culture and replace that with Western Christianity. And it was really an attempt to destroy one and rebuild on top of the ashes. Quite literally, that's what some of the work that they did. The royal palace that we saw earlier stood on ground that was originally occupied by the royal school, which was built by the missionaries, which was built on top of a burial ground that hold, held the bones of ancient warriors. That sacred spot with the ancient warriors was taken over by the missionaries to build their school. Cultural imperialism follows, again, a set playbook, and one of the things is you build your stuff on top of the other, other guy's stuff as a way of telling them how things, there's a new sheriff in town right now. Nonetheless, the missionaries were very successful in their proselytizing. They worked from the top down. They started with the royal family who took to Christianity with great zeal. They were fans of the British monarchy, who were Christians famously, of course, and they began to understand the power of this new religion, um, particularly the idea of commandments. The royal family here in Hawaii had ruled through what was known as a kapu, which is essentially a prohibition, saying you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this other thing. And they saw a lot of connections between how God dealt with his own flock the way that they were dealing with their own people. That said, the missionaries did not ignore the local people. They built the public school system here, which is still named after Kamehameha. They built hospitals and they brought Western medicine here. This is why history gets complicated. While they were destroying the Hawaiian culture, they were saving it by for the very first time giving native Hawaiian people the tools and the science they needed to push back against these diseases. Modern midwifery techniques were introduced, which raised, along with monogamy, raised the live birth level and actually rebuilt the indigenous population from almost near levels of, of extinction. And so I leave you all 
with the story of the missionaries as a way of leaving you with something to think about. History is never black and white, good and bad. It's oftentimes presented that way, but it's actually a fallacy. History is always complicated. It's always shades of gray and no place more than here in Hawaii. I hope that someday you can get out here and see our islands yourself to experience all of this with this as background to maybe understand a little bit more about modern Hawaii and how Hawaiian people interact with the world. My hope is that this cultural re-understanding that's going on here is going to lead to a greater pride that Hawaiian people will want to share with more and more people and that post-COVID we will not only be welcoming you all but welcoming the world back to what is honestly paradise on earth. My name is Peter Van Buren. Thank you for spending the time with me. I think we have time for questions or comments and I'll be happy to answer absolutely anything. Woo, Peter! Woo uh, obviously, the, obviously the paparazzi have found us here. And uh, no, I'm sorry the rumors about Madonna and I are, 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 well, some of them are true, but not all of them are true. And some questions. Guys, if you have any questions before we head out, uh, then you know. Because we're going to the beach. You go ahead and, and throw them in there, but also feel free to, uh, if you're watching this later on, if it's too late or too early for you, depending upon where you are right now in the audience, if you put the questions up there, uh, Anna Maria says, I'm getting on a plane in Hawaii in three, two, one. Excellent. I'll fair, meet you at the airport. Fair enough. You had some, some comments before Michaela had written, uh, I could listen forever. Uh, um, Thank you. You know, Michelle writes, Peter is amazing. Um, uh, and uh, I was going to say, go ahead and leave. To, you can either write up your, your questions onto the YouTube comment section down below the video. And then uh, Peter or myself, we can go back in and see them and, and, and view them. Or if you're on Facebook, you can just write it into the regular Facebook comment section. And those will stay with the video. Uh, but if you put a question into the comments here after we end the on YouTube after we end the live stream we just won't see those later on so you got to add them to the comments in the video or on Facebook like I said there uh, some comments coming right now Jenny Jean great tour thank you purple heart love those purple hearts Michaela gives you applause Nikki writes how expensive is it to stay in the area you are currently in um, uh, Mila uh, writes, thank you, Peter, Michelle, Aloha with a thumbs up, and Maria, thank you uh, for the tour, loved it. Uh, Nikki's question, how expensive is it? Well, you know, Hawaii, unfortunately, is not the cheapest travel destination. Um, we never have been. Uh, we like to think that what we have here is worth what, we, what it costs to get here. One of the things to do, of course, is to look at uh, alternatives to traditional uh, large Waikiki hotels. They're great places. They have all the amenities. They take care of you very well, but they do charge you for all that. You want to take a look uh, at uh, some Airbnbs. This is, uh, again, somewhat controversial here in Hawaii. Um, Airbnb is kind of in the process of trying to find their space in Hawaii, but there still are options available. Another option available are the off-the-beach hotels here in Hawaii. You're never very far from anything, and so you can save an awful lot of money. You can almost kind of calculate it block by block. One block from the beach, you save 50 bucks. Two blocks from the beach, you save a little bit more. The other thing you want to do when you're looking at hotel prices is make sure that you're looking at the total price. Um, Hawaii has a fairly uh, generous hotel tax that they levy and a lot of hotels during the COVID era have started levying resort taxes. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen your bill yet, Chris. Um, I'm staying with my cousin, so it's free. Okay, so you can also stay with Chris's cousin while you're here, uh, which is very nice. Um, is he good? Does he make a nice breakfast? He doesn't. I cook breakfast. All right, Chris is going to cook breakfast for you. But seriously, um, what you want to do is make sure when you're looking at hotel prices, you're looking at the whole price. The resort yeah. fee, the parking fee, if you're going to need that, the taxes, because oftentimes, I, I'm, I'm sorry to say, they can add 20, 30, 40 yeah. percent to what the room rate actually is. That's actually on purpose often with the resort fees, because um, if you're booking through an online travel agency rather than booking direct with the hotel, they're paying that 30 percent, 20 percent commission to the booking site and then they, they end up not charging the commission. The booking sites don't charge the commission on the resort fees. Yeah, so shop around. So the around. resort fees just go right to the hotel. Um, shop so. around and compare things. The other thing to keep in mind is that travel to Hawaii is very seasonal. 
And so the price you pay during the high season of, of May till September is much, much higher than you pay in the off seasons. Also watch for holidays, the prices will jump. Uh, right now we have a lot of very inexpensive flights from the West Coast and a lot of people coming out for long weekends. And so midweek prices, weekend prices, prices for Thanksgiving, you've got to really do a little bit of homework on it to save some money. The other thing to think about, and this is a personal uh, decision you need to make, is whether or not you, you need to see the ocean uh, from your room. Uh, Hawaiian hotels, even, even the inexpensive ones, charge premiums for the view. Mm -hmm. And so if you're a little bit watching your, your pennies or you'd rather spend your money on, on a good meal out or say a, a tour here in Hawaii, um, you may want to make do with a view of the parking lot. Uh, if you're here on your honeymoon and you want everything to be perfect, then that extra for the, the balcony and the ocean view may be just what the doctor ordered. But keep in mind you have all those options and you can manipulate them and study them and maybe save yourself a, a little bit of money. Is there, are there campsites that people in theory could fly to Hawaii with a tent and, and just live out on a campsite? Um, that's a good question. There's a lot of semi-legal camping that does, that does go on in Hawaii. Um, a lot of people do set up on beaches and things. I don't know if it's fully legal and I, mm. I've, I have to plead a little bit of ignorance about whether there's actual official campsite kind of uh, places. You may want to look into that. I've seen lots of unofficial campsites. Well, for sure. unfortunately, we do have some homeless uh, problems here, but a lot of the areas uh, have options and the more creative you are and the more uh, research you do, I think it actually all can pay off in serious money. Um, the other thing about saving money tips is uh, to consider getting good at the bus system here. Our bus system it may not be the fastest in the world, but it goes absolutely everywhere. And for $275 a person, you can get from anywhere to anywhere on, on the island. And clever use of the bus system can save you an awful lot of money. Gas is expensive here, and rental cars can be uh, expensive. So there's a lot of ways to make this less expensive, but it's never going to be, I'm afraid, a uh, budget destination. Right, but, but, in, but then it's also relative because wages here are, are generally higher. Uh, and I've seen, you know, the help wanted ads and even retail shops saying starting at $15, $18 an hour to be retail checkout clerk. And, and so it kind of comes out in the wash maybe for... In, in the way, in the way. It's, it's not an inexpensive place, but as I yeah. said, it's, to me, uh, it's worth every penny that it costs. Ah, uh, hey, thank you so much. This was amazing. It's been a pleasure. Uh, I, the groups loved it. Uh, bar checking in at the end there. Good to see you too, Bar. It's been a little while. Uh, Charlene, preparing activity over location. Great, thanks for joining us. Um, Peter, we didn't talk about this before, but we have a tradition that whenever we have a, a guest guide, then when we end the live stream, you have to press the end button. That's up there in the top right-hand corner. Can you see it up I, there where my kind of head is? What if I don't want to press it? Oh, then we just keep going. We, we just never, keep going. We All right, end. well, I've got it's some like free time. Never-ending story. Oh, wait, wait. He's starting to sing. I think that's really time a time when I think we need to press the button. Thank you, everybody. Come see us in Hawaii. Aloha, guys. Take care.